It's time. ATM, the Apologise to Me podcast. My name is Martin Devlin from The Platform, and with me is Mark Watson. What a welcome back. How are you, Marty? How is Mr. Mediocrity, Mr. B minus? No, I am absolutely rocking and rolling, mate. And uh, thank you for the baseball on the weekend before we even start. What a fantastic game that is to go and see at North Harbour. The Tuatara are back, 2,500 on a Friday night with a one day at Eden Park and the World Softball Champs going on and over a 1,000 days since the fans had seen the team at home. I thought there was a rock, rock and roll crowd. Yeah, look, pretty good. Pretty good experience. I mean, the game you came to on the Saturday too, uh, Martin, Tuatara clearly went at their best, hit back beautifully Saturday night. But look, I think they do it really well. I think it's a great entertainment package. It's different, isn't it? I mean, it's not dominated by the bat like cricket, but it always helps though when you get the seats that you got, Martin, right behind home plate. Yeah, lovely. Um, mm. And that's the privilege of being, you know, that's the privilege of being Martin Devlin, isn't it's it? It's the privilege of knowing the boss, mate, knowing the owner is what it is. He had one rule, which was when the foul ball hits the netting, don't flinch. And of course, I squealed and I jumped. So, yeah, next time I'll be calm and collected. All right, let's got so many topics to talk about. Uh, the new athletes' union led by Mahi Drysdale taking high performance sport New Zealand to court. South Africa's demolition of England. What the hell did that tell you? Could Marty Guptill have been treated better? We've got the Football World Cup to talk about. Apologise to me! Opening it up, though, with World Rugby are going to try and speed up the game. They want a stopwatch brought on for scrums, for lineouts, for take and kicks, and to get rid of the water boys. Finally, mate, finally, a World Rugby waking up to what the rest of us have been seeing and saying for the last decade? Oh, look, it's a game that's just under siege, though, isn't it? I mean, the All Blacks try and play it the way I think William Webb Ellis wanted to play it. Uh, play it fast, play it quick, but there are South Africans feigning injury. There are teams that, you know, have a player go down and suddenly all of that hard work you've done in terms of capitalising on your own fitness and exploiting perhaps the lack of fitness on the other side, well, that's all just suddenly undone with the stop start. And um, yeah, look, something needs to change. Something just needs to change with rugby. They clearly don't want to change the rules. And I, I think that's one of the big drawbacks when it comes to rugby are the rules. But it is. It's the slowing down of the game. Get on with it. The game needs to be fast flowing. It needs to move. Football does it well. Basketball does it well. And then here we go with rugby. It's so stop start. I mean, in an 80 minute game, how, how many minutes? I think 20 minutes, mate. I think, I think there's actually 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. Minutes. Yeah. Mm. And you just sort of sit there and you go, there's another minute wasted with a reset scrum and there's another minute wasted with another reset scrum and then suddenly you're chasing the game with about two minutes to go and you think, how much time have we actually wasted just resetting scrums? Look, I, I, I was doing some futsal commentary the other week, which is basically indoor soccer, if people are not familiar with it. 20 minutes each way, but what they actually do is they stop the clock every time the ball goes out. So the game actually lasts 80 or 90 minutes, but you know that the ball is actually going to be in play for the full 40 minutes, and it makes it a quality top, uh, contest. It means that your players need to be fit. Yeah, well, that's, you know, two things about this. One of them is that this whole eight people on the bench thing just uh, yeah, and clearing the benches so that players only play 50 or 60 minutes these days anyway. I mean, that just drives me absolutely crazy. I mean, the whole point of the game is physical attrition. You're meant to wear your opponent down so that if they are unfit, if they don't have air in the lungs, if they can't handle the last 20 minutes and the score blows out, that's the whole point of the game, isn't it? And so replacing half the team, you know, with 20 to go, I'd, I'd, I'd totally disagree with that anyway. And the other thing is the goddamn water boy it's the same in rugby league get off the pitch the players should have no water until half time and if you're bursting and you need a drink well sub yourself off mate and and go back to training and go and go do some more physical strength training or whatever it's going to take for your actual lungs to be able to handle it because i mean you know again i mean that's you know you, you what you're turning the game into is, you, is, is you're turning the game into 60 second bites is what you're turning it into and now i totally well, agree with you. it's meant to be a game of continuum that's why you know so many people are saying mark they're watching the women it's actually like rugby used to be played. And that's why I think people are enjoying it. It just get the balls in play. They want to use it. They want to create space. They want to run with it. Well, it's a turn off for the NFL for me. Like, I love my American football. I love the way the game's set up. I love the way it's played. But it's just so damn stop start. And, you know, these games end up being three hours and then it just ends up being one big sort of advertising fest. But, 
Yeah, look, I, I completely agree. I mean, the women's game is great. You don't get the reset scrums. They probably don't quite have the kicking game, so you don't tend to sort of kick the touch as much, and the game is in play for a lot, lot longer. Um, so, yeah, look, anything they can do to try and make the product a better product, well, I completely agree. But also I do. I think it benefits New Zealand. I think it benefits those sides that are fit. Um, but, yeah, I mean... I think the water boys are more on, aren't they? Because, you know, the players these days are so over-resourced, they actually don't know how to think for themselves anymore out there in the 80 minutes. And the water boys are just basically running coaching Yeah, they're running coaching. The That's what they're time. doing. New do coaching this, message. Do that, yeah. Do this, yeah. Do that. And it's like, get rid of them. Let the players play the game. Let the players think. And let the players actually go, hang on a minute. Now, we came out here with plan A. The opposition's not allowing us to do that. Maybe we need to adopt plan B and actually go. empower these yeah. players to start thinking for themselves because I'm sick and tired of a team being down and it requires a half-time speech for them to come out and sort of right the wrongs. Well, it's interesting you say that, mate. Look, we had Justin Marshall on last week and he actually said this, you know, he was talking about that last 10 minutes and I got him to explain what was actually going on and he said, you know, it was up to the senior players against England at that stage to take charge. Okay, they are playing differently. This is how you do it. And when I was listening to him, I was thinking, well, do the the players these days actually even think for themselves like that or do they just wait for the order from the coaching box saying, can you please tell us how the game is actually, how the game is manifesting here and and what we're actually meant to do? Apologise to me. All right, topic number two, mate. And this this is where the wokeness of uh, sporting administrations around the world, somebody needs to handbrake this and somebody needs to slap about this. The United States Football Association taking it upon themselves to remove part of the Iranian flag from their social media. They knew it was going to cause a, a you know a, 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 an international incident. They knew that there was going to be a big response to it. They did this without asking the US men's national team at all. Uh, the PR spokesperson for the United States Football Association won't actually reveal whether the people in charge authorised it or not. That's how gutless these people are, spineless they are. They stay in the shadows. They make these decisions. Now you've got the men's national football team coach coming out at press conferences having to apologise. You've got to the players saying, hey, look, we don't want to offend any of the Iranian players or anything like this. Isn't this just the height of ridiculousness where an administrator, a bozo, some fishhead in an office is doing things, making decisions and disrupting what is actually going on at the tournament for their players? What on earth was the point of this? Yeah, you should never, ever have your own sort of individual political bias come through. Never, ever put those political decisions ahead of performance decisions. Don't put commercial decisions ahead of performance decisions. Look, you know, it, it, it's the people in Iran at the moment are not happy with their own government. They're out there protesting. They're looking for crying and get some change. You do not go and bastardise a nation's flag. Can you imagine if it was the other way around? Yeah, God, exactly, man. Instead of taking stars off the off the American flag and or, or changing the colours on it. I mean, they'd basically have their submarines uh, sitting off the, you know, off the Gulf of, you know, in, in the Mediterranean. They're almost ready to strike. And it's just, this is where, what annoys me is the Americans and sometimes countries in the West think they can get away with anything. They hide behind, oh yeah, but it's all about democracy and we don't agree with their human rights. Well, last time I checked, the United States still execute people. Their foreign policy is not exactly squeaky clean. And how dare you go and judge other countries because somehow uh, they disagree with the way um, you know they allow their, their, their people to live and it's football just get on enjoy the football you know if you're really that concerned why the hell are you in bloody Qatar in the first place because their human rights issue is not great they don't sit necessarily on the right side of the political spectrum so if you're going to start picking the Iranians apart why don't you just go full tilt and not even turn up no well, I mean but, I mean that's the point is it is and we've discussed in previous weeks is that no sponsors have pulled out no players have pulled out no no teams have pulled out there was some bozo ran onto the pitch today the Portugal game uh, and, uh, you know, with a, a rainbow flag. And, you know, and I sat there and I thought, look, I'm, I understand all the protests. I'm, I'm on the side of all of the, the protests. But at the same time, if you in a foreign country decide that you're going to break the law like that, well, it's like Brittany Griner. The consequence of is that your government can't help you. You've broken the law in another country. It's up to them to decide what to do with you from that point on. Yeah, oh, look, absolutely. I keep saying that, though. You imagine turning up and doing that sort of stuff and, in America or going into the heart of America that are pro-gun and you're anti-gun lobby and you're from a completely different country. How long do you think you're going to last? How long do you think you're going to survive? Okay, I say this. If you don't agree 
with the laws in a country, if you don't agree with the way they do things, there are other ways of getting your point across. But the first thing I would recommend is don't go and visit that country and certainly don't go in there and try and moral police them. And make sure you have a pretty good understanding of your own foreign policy and have a pretty good understanding of the complete and utter hypocrisy that sometimes exists within your own country. Mark Watson is with us. It's the ATM podcast. South Africa's demolition of England. Let's go back to the rugby. What did it tell you when it wrapped up all of the test matches for this year? It's a 13 win, one draw, 13 win split between the Northern and Southern Hemispheres. So pretty much everything is even. We're in a position where we don't really know who the best team in the world is. I suppose it's France because they're unbeaten this year. But that South African demolition, pace, power and using their backline, does it scare you? Well, it just shows me how inept the All Blacks were against England. I think that puts into context just where this All Black really is, where this All Black team really is. Um, I think we sort of came away from the Northern Hemisphere with, a, 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 I think, a false sense of reality. I think we've come home um, believing that perhaps we're a bit better than we are. And I think South Africa just demonstrated that, again, England aren't that good. Eddie Jones is in, uh, under a lot of pressure. I think South Africa probably along with France, in my opinion, go into next year's World Cup with their noses in front. I think Ireland, some of the performances they put up, perhaps not quite as good as we are made to believe. I think clearly they got the All Blacks with one of the worst All Black teams and arguably one of the worst three-test performances or two-test performances we've seen from an All Black team in a long time. So, But you're right, though. I mean, it's a really, really even Rugby World Cup. I'm still annoyed by the draw that South Africa, New Zealand, France, and um, 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 Ireland. Ireland are all on yeah. one side, and that after the quarterfinals, two of those four teams are gone. It just seems to me that Australia, Wales, uh, England, and Argentina have a much easier side of the draw. Yes, ultimately, you've still got to beat the top teams to win the World Cup. But you know, you look at you look at this football World Cup tournament at the moment, and you look at the results of Morocco, Belgium. You look at the performances of Japan, Germany, uh, the fact that... Saudi beat um, Argy. Uh, yeah, Saudi beat Argy, but you can't see that at the Rugby World Cup. And sort of once those two of those four teams are knocked out in the quarterfinals, it becomes a pretty boring, pretty predictable type of tournament. You've got one good game in each pool, or two good games in each pool in the round robin, and the rest of it's fairly predictable. And... Um, you know, for all the talk that we get around the Rugby World Cup, oh, this is the third or fourth biggest sporting event in the world. Can we just stop with all that rubbish, mate? Because it is just rubbish. It's world famous here in New Zealand. It's world famous in the Commonwealth. But in comparison to things like the FIFA Football World Cup, it, it's not even on the same scale. And I don't think they're helping themselves in terms of the way they set the draw up. Um, as I said, it, it, it's a good thing that there's some parity now across those top six, seven countries. Uh, but even within that, I mean, you think Argentina are good for knocking over a country, but they're not good enough to put three performances back. No, back, no, I don't they? know if anyone but, is though, mate. I mean, that's a serious, you know, that's a, that's the question that has to be answered next year. Who can go three matches in a row, three knockout matches in a row? Well, I think South Africa can. I think Ireland can. Okay, all right. Well, those are your two teams. Apologise to me. Football World Cup to talk about in just a second. The new athletes union led by Mahi Drysdale taking high performance sport New Zealand to the employment court. There's multi layers to this, isn't there? And, you know, for a start, athletes need representation. Uh, they need honesty. They need transparency. Somehow they have to take a government department to court, a government department whose officials can hide behind QCs, KCs and expensive law firms and spend our taxes on this. This is the inequity of it, isn't it? And I don't know why not, you know, the, the mass sports media are not making more of this. How is it possible, possibly fair, Mark, that our taxes are funding a sports organisation full of largesse, full of excess against the athletes that they represent. I mean, Mahi Drysdale is doing God's work here. But, for you know, for goodness sake, why are our taxes paying for these fish heads, these anonymous administrators, these people who just slither and weasel off to jobs after they've been proved absolutely incompetent? Why are we paying for this? Oh, look, and I agree, and I think this is more the issue with Mahi Drysdale is the fact that he is the athlete on the front line. These guys, they get to a pretty damn high level have proven themselves that it's not necessarily about money. They are ultimately driven. Then they do get to a point where they go, look, for me to be the best, I just need to have a little bit more security because I'm getting a little bit later in life and I'm seeing my friends and stuff sort of 
being able to buy houses and being able to do things. Now, I never like to hear athletes say, oh, the sacrifices we make. Now, hang on a minute. You've decided to do this and you're living your dream and you're chasing it and you're wanting to be the best you can be and you're looking to represent your country and you're looking to go to the Olympics and they're intangible. So I don't like to hear the word sacrifice because no one's holding a gun to their head. But what annoys athletes, and I completely understand it, is just watching these academics with these academic degrees on the wall filling up layers of the Millennium Institute, the different departments around the country that come under the heading of high performance sport and all of these people making six figures plus probably closer to $150,000 there's someone employed there to go and talk to the athletes about you need to make sure you've got something else in case this falls over really you need to tell an athlete that or will employ someone to tell an athlete that and I think that is the frustration that it seems to be too top heavy it seems to be the academics that are making all the money the athletes themselves are only really getting rewarded once they've actually reached the absolute highest level, i.e. winning an Olympic medal. Now, I never want to see uh, this collective body that Mahi Drysdale getting to the point where it's like the Players Association for Cricket and Rugby, where the tail is wagging the dog, where the only people that end up doing any well out of it are the players. And, you know, you look at rugby with how club rugby struggling might attend cup and super rugby, as we've discussed, and it seems to be too top heavy. The other thing with the Mahi Drysdale thing there needs to also be a level of accountability on the athlete. And at what level do you start allowing these athletes to have a say? At what level do you allow these athletes to be a little bit more empowered and to be able to take greater direction? I don't want to see 18, 19, 20-year-olds um, yeah, being able to have that level of power. I mean, there's always got to be a degree of adversity, I think, with athletes. There's got to be a, a level of jeopardy because I think that you find out who's truly truly driven. but what they've got to be protected from will, mark yeah but always, i agree with all of that but they've got to be protected yeah sure but they've got to be protected from you know idiots bozos and and as you say academics with qualifications who hide behind their own incompetence like cycling new zealand with two different reviews and both reviews saying the same i mean how many reviews of sport had in this country probably at least i'm not joking to say 15 to 20 there and yet none of these administrators are ever held to account for for the mistakes that they make you know, the athletes are always held to account because if you make a mistake or if, or, or if your performance is poor, you get found out and it's in public. These other people, these other administrators, these fish heads don't, mate. I mean, they just hide. And if, and, if, and if they get called out in a bad review, well, then, you know, it's always oh, employment c conditions, clauses, um, and it's all anonymity and it's all confidentiality. And we never hear. And the same idiot goes in and he just gets another couple of hundred grand to go somewhere else within high performance sport New Zealand or another government department. I mean, when does that actually stop? When, when does the transparency actually start yeah look i completely agree and i've come under a number of different national uh you've worked for a number of different nsos or national sports organizations i've sat on boards i've seen some very competent ceos and i've seen some very incompetent ones and you're right a lot of them come in do a two or three year people start to see through them and then they move on to the next one and it's just this merry-go-round and they're a certain type of person they're very good at um they're good talkers uh they're good at the politics, they're good at shaking hands, and you're right, and they find a way of somehow shifting blame somewhere else, putting it on others, and being able to run and being able to hide, and it's very, very political indeed, and I think that's Mahi's frustration as well. Um, but, you know, we, we've also got to a point, though, too, haven't we, where we've actually seen some athletes who I just don't think have actually been good enough and have been looking for excuses to um, shift blame for their own poor performances by accusing coaches have been bullies as well and so it can go both ways to a degree and the media tend to at that time I think tend to favour some of the athletes and those coaches end up getting much maligned and they have their reputations ruined so look we've got to sit down at the table we've got to find a way of sorting this out um, athletes do need to make sure they can ever say they do need to make sure that they're held accountable but equally too as you said Martin there's got to be a much higher level of accountability going back on the administrators. I think coaches, I think that's a different discussion game, but the administrators, these people that make these decisions, um, the lack of due diligence is done. But also go right back to the recruiting process. I mean, I've applied for a number of jobs that people said, hey, look, you'll be really, really good at this. But it's funny how you just get pigeonholed. They see what they want to see. They just, they're just going after a certain type of person. And you just sit there and you go, I'm not going to get this. I'm not in the running for this. I, I don't tick that box. I'm not that political guy. I'm not that quiet guy. I'm not that, 
uh, yeah, no, I, I'm not that sort of, I don't have that academic, softly spoken sort of uh, demeanour about me, which is, which is almost a prerequisite to getting your foot in the door these days. Apologise to me! All right then, let's wrap it up with Marty Guptill. And is there a nice way to be exited from a national team? Uh, you know, he's such a, a, a decent bloke, a good bloke. You always meet him. He's just, you know, there's, there's something really likeable about, about Marty as well as being a great cricketer and everything else. And it is sad when somebody wants to still be playing and they're not picked. I just wonder whether there's a better way of handling and whether New Zealand cricket could have handled it. Oh, look, if the guy's if the guy's not in the team anymore and he's and somebody else takes his place, that's what happens in sport. We all understand that. Do you think that they could have actually done this a bit better? Because they've to me they seem to have known about it for a lot longer New Zealand cricket than 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 perhaps the rest of us have, and so therefore there's enough time to prepare. May I'm not saying give him a farewell match, but just I don't know. It just it just felt a little kind of untidy. Oh, look, this just goes back to what we've just been talking about, though. I think this is part of what Amar Hay Drysdale's talking about. It's just a lack of... It's just a, a lack of dignity. It's just a lack of... It's just poor management. Martin Guptill deserves better because Martin Guptill has left the legacy. Martin Guptill has been a long-time servant. I just don't think we have done this well for a long time. I don't think... And taking it beyond that, I don't think that we give players the farewell that sometimes they deserve. Look at the way the Americans do things, you know. They celebrate their greats. They bring them out onto the grounds. They do it with fanfare. You know, they retire their numbers. They put their name up in lights and they build statues or they have plaques at certain grounds and it's done really, really well. And I would imagine that Martin Guptill probably feels a little bit embarrassed. I'd imagine that there's a lot of anger with Martin Guptill. Hey, I've been a servant for a long time. Um, yes, I've probably been remunerated well. Yes, I've set myself up. But I think it's just decency, isn't it? It's just decency to be able to do this with just a little bit more dignity. Now, I'm not sure what was said behind the scenes. I'm not sure how well this was handled. I'm not sure whether there was a discussion six or eight weeks out saying, hey, look, Martin, um, you know, look, changes are coming. And unfortunately, you might be a victim of those changes. This happens in sport. But yes, do we need to do it a bit better? Uh, look, absolutely we do. And this goes back to this whole mental health issue. We've, we've seen these situations of athletes getting dropped from teams or, or, or not being selected for certain teams and the huge and the huge psychological impact and, and how upsetting that can be. Uh, the Olivia Podmore situation, I think a classic example. Now, Martin Guptill's a little bit older. He's probably a little bit wiser. He's probably dealt with a little bit of adversity in his career. But, but whether it be... A young athlete, whether it be an older athlete, I think there needs to be a clear process in place and it does need to be managed better. And I think that, yeah, the managing in terms of the way it's dealt in the public too also needs to be managed just a little bit better. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.